Currently serving as the President of the Middle East Policy Council, she has held senior positions in the United States government, including Ambassador to the Republic of Malta, Consul Gen General in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, Foreign Policy Advisor to the Commander of U.S. Cyber Forces, Deputy Coordinator for Counterterrorism, and Director of the Office of Egypt and the Levant at the U.S. Department of State. Amid these roles, Ambassador Abercrombie Wynne Stanley expanded counterterrorism partners and programs and coordinated the largest evacuation of American citizens from a war zone since World War II. Prior to her most recent senior appointment as Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at the U.S. Department of State, Ambassador Abercrombie Wynne Stanley was a member of the Middle East Policy Council's Board of Directors. I would now like to introduce our keynote speaker, Ambassador Abercrombie Wynne Stanley. Good evening, everyone. Is there something special about this front row? I feel the need for bodies. Someone's got to move up. I'm looking at you. That was my auntie look. Did you get that? That means no argument, move on up. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'd like to start by expressing my appreciation to those responsible for my invitation and graciously handling the logistics, complex logistics that got me here this evening. So thank you, Director Destiny Coleman, Dr. Matt Volroth, and Dana Tui from the Voltamade Center. I'd also like to thank Dr. Vanessa Hildebrand and Dr. Eva Paris from the Palmer Global Studies. Lastly, of course, the Heisler family. I also want to recognize the honoree of a different lecture series, Dr. Butler A. Jones. Dr. Jones was an admired and longtime family friend, so I know that some of you attend those lectures as well. Before I start, I want to make clear to you that any topic I cover or don't cover is open in the question and answer period. This, these are troubled times in the world. And this is a place where we get to discuss the issues that are outstanding. So I want you to know that. So I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and after more than 30 years of international service, I am proud to call Ohio home again. I'm proof that you can engage on an international scale and be true to your roots. My Ohio upbringing has been a major part of my success both as a specialist in the Middle East and as the first standalone Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at the Department of State. I've traveled the world and built up a remarkable resume. You've heard some of it this evening. I've done more good than bad in the world, I'm sure. Work has been fun on a regular basis. I've had the opportunity to make things better for people and to contribute toward the type of world that I want to live in. I've received numerous awards and accolades. Thank you again for hosting me this evening. And I've been in 65 countries, 18 in the last two years. I was looking them up and I realized I have not been to a D country. So I've got to get to Denmark, Djibouti, Democratic Republic of Congo, or the Dominican Republic, right? Yeah, those are the D ones. I have met kings and no presidents. I have two generally sane children, speak to all of my beloved siblings, and have been in love with the same man for 43 years. A great resume. What's not included in that great resume are my stumbles. The occasional challenges that have been placed in my path and to my vision. Not mentioned are the many times I've heard not yet. No, it's not your time. No. Not included is that I've been fired three times. Three times. I have been certain that my career was over. I was told point blank, we don't want you. But after each firing, I came back and I continued to rise. 
with that amount of uh, experience of success and failure, I've learned that the level of my success hinges on how much care and attention I give to five things. So you're all going to have to remember these five things or take notes or ask. Pull out your phones and you can write them in. I know you have your phones with you. Number one, advocacy. The ability to argue for yourself and make your case, what you prioritize, what you find important. Number two, know your system, how it works, where decisions are made. Three, coalition building. There is power in numbers. Four, people will let you down. People will let you down. Prepare for it. And number five, grace. The importance of grace, of forgiveness when people let you down. And remember, you forgive others and you forgive yourself. The times I lost sight of those five things are the times I stumbled. In spite of my mother insisting to me daily that I was very special, she probably said the same thing to my siblings, but I don't ask. I'm not that special. I'm smart, but I work with a lot of smart and talented people. And yet, over my career, I was surprised repeatedly to come across too many really smart and talented people who look like me, but who were struggling, struggling in our chosen profession and other people who also had a different background from a typical American diplomat were also having a tough time. Colleagues did not find the success that their abilities and talent had led them to expect. And that's what led me over time to not only focus on the work of my organization, the Department of State Diplomacy, but on the organization itself and how it cared for its most important resource the people. Secretaries Clinton and Secretary of State, Secretary Gates of Defense, used to talk about the three imperatives, the three Ds of America's foreign policy and preserving our national security. Diplomacy, defense, development. Whether we provide development assistance or arms to nations around the world, the U.S. getting it right depends on who's in the room and who gets heard. I was at a conference last week hosted by an organization that gathers development assistance organizations and focuses on supporting greater diversity and inclusion in the development field. They recognize that local knowledge and more varied backgrounds and experiences and connections were imperative in leadership's decisions on the what of assistance. What are we giving? The when of assistance. When are we giving it? When are we putting it in place? When are we building it, supporting it? And the where to ensure that foreign assistance sustains positive change. I'm reminded of an incident. Some of you may be too young, but some of you might recall a few years back when the United States was sending, selling chickens to Latin American countries. I'm thinking Venezuela specifically, but someone will correct me if I'm wrong. And American chickens, as we all know, we like them plump and meaty, and so we fill them full of antibiotics and hormones. But in this particular country, those chickens were rejected out of hand. No one would take them, couldn't give them away, let alone sell them because people believed that the hormones were causing men to adapt, adopt, adapt, adopt female characteristics. And so we couldn't give the chickens away. But if someone, when the decisions about what we were going to send had been in the room with local knowledge, we would not have wasted our time and our effort and considerable monetary resources. Even now, those voices are too often missing. The same for military relationships and overall diplomacy. Let me share with you some recent statistics that I hope make clear how stark the need is for change of who is in the room 
at the table making the decisions across the board in our senior ranks. These are the sorts of numbers that I walked into as the first Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer in the Department of State. I'm going to use the military equivalent ranks because those are better known from television. You hear about generals and colonels and majors, but you don't hear about GS 14s and 15s and senior executive service. So I'm giving you the equivalents. I'm talking about heritage demographics, where we all come from for shorthand. So European American, African American, Asian American, Hispanic, Latin American, et cetera. So, these are from 2017. This is people who were promoted from the lieutenant colonel to the colonel rank. It is the senior level before you become a general or an admiral, flag officer. Of those who are competing for promotion in the American diplomatic corps, European Americans promoted 1,091. Asian Americans promoted. 99. African Americans promoted, 66. Hispanic Latin Americans promoted, 60. Multi-race, 31. Not identified, 31. Okay. Those promoted to the diplomatic general admiral equivalent, that is those who are making the policy. European Americans, 81. Hispanic, and that includes white, black, or brown, because you can be any and be Latin or from Hispanic heritage, six. Multi-race, five. Not identified, four. Asian American, one. African American, zero. The numbers are similar in the military and development. I believe these make clear that when decisions are being made, all of the right people are not in the room, not in the room. When we are deciding how we conduct ourselves in the world, we need all of us represented in that room. Leaders with knowledge of the results of armed conflict, the devastation, the loss of life, loss of infrastructure, knowledge, everything that we know that goes on from Congo, from Venezuela, from Myanmar, with the loss of farmland or access to water, people with those sorts of knowledge, either from connections, from family, from experienced Peace Corps volunteers who I love and anyone interested in Peace Corps, talk to me after. These people might flag different or additional considerations as we decide how to deal, how to grapple with these issues than leaders who all hail from Western Europe background. Socioeconomic differences are exactly the same. The numbers are not quite as bad for women, but they are not where they should be considering that we are the majority of the population, we're very smart, and we make great diplomats because we work not from positions of Power. Even in the face of these numbers, which people know, there is still, as we all know, a backlash against, I don't even want to say the word because it annoys me so much since no one can define it, but against DEIA. There is a backlash against addressing the reality that the numbers I have shared with you are statistically impossible without some level of bias being included in the selection and promotion process. Impossible. And the bias that's in the selection and promotion process leads to retention failures. When people don't see a pathway for them, when they don't feel valued, they are going to leave. Now, there are multiple confirmed reasons for smart organizations to pursue and successfully implement improved talent management, what we call it, for everyone. And for those pursuing a role in foreign affairs, they boil down to just a few things. Better decision-making. Different backgrounds bring 
different pathways of thinking, seeing problems. You come up with different recommendations, different options, and more of them. Improved cultural competence, an understanding of who's across the table from you when you're negotiating or arguing, as the case may be. You can better understand what their priorities are. Improved innovation, unlocking the talent among the entire workforce, attracting the best talent across the board, and holding on to it. I sometimes resist answering the question that I get asked when doing DEIA, because it's insulting, uh, which is, oh, well, can you tell me what would have, you know, having a woman in the room, what would that make better? Having someone with a disability in the room, how would that make it better? Or a, a brown person or someone from the Midwest. Ohioans make great diplomats, by the way. But no one ever gets asked, well, how do you as a European American make it better? No one asks that question. But as a minority and as a woman, I get asked. So usually I smack them. But this way, <laughs> I'm going to give you some examples of where I know I made a difference being in the room and at the table. As a young officer, I was posted to the Gaza Strip. My portfolio included human rights, and I got to know the Minister of Justice, who became a dear friend, and the head of the Palestinian Human Rights Center at that time. And this is right after Arafat came back. So the Israelis had withdrawn to the borders. The civil administration had run Gaza for I don't know how many years. I should know, but you can look it up. And the Palestinians were establishing law and order, their government. So we often discuss the challenges of securing human rights in the Gaza Strip, of putting in place law and order. Because keep in mind, the Israelis just pulled everything out. So the new authority was setting up, establishing a justice system, setting up law enforcement, police, and their court system. And I learned in these conversations that actual copies of the laws that governed the Gaza Strip, because they were governed by Egypt, the West Bank was governed by Jordan, were in short supply. People just didn't have access to the laws. And a lot of errors across the board, both from lawyers, from judges, and from people who came into the court system, didn't know what the law was. And I went back to the embassy, and I talked to my friends and colleagues at the Agency for International Development that support infrastructure and, and democracy building in countries. And I said, what can we do? Can't we do something to help this along? And they said, mm, well, maybe you got to talk to. So I talked to several levels of colleagues in the Agency for International Development in the embassy and worked it up the ladder, advocating. That first thing I said about being able to advocate for yourself, so I had to make the case that I knew what I was talking about, that I was putting forward a plan that had good foundation and basis. And in the end, the US government via AID printed 25,000 copies of Gazan law. And we distributed those laws to the courts, to lawyers, to government agencies, the universities that were there, three and two high schoolers, so they could start to learn as well. And that was positive, really tangible impact that the US government had in the Gaza Strip at the time, because Clearly, more will be needed. And I was pretty much a junior officer, we called them back then. We try not to call people junior anymore because some people come in much older. But I was a junior officer just seeing, talking, having an idea, and working it through. So that ability to, to advocate for yourself, make sure you do that. A more troubling example occurred when I was at the National Security Council. Here, I need to be a little careful, but I think I can share enough so that you understand. Um, I was a mid-level officer by this point and very excited to be working in the White House. And I was the Director of Legislative Affairs. My job was to help develop strategies to, to obtain congressional support for the President's legislative priorities. So if he wanted um, some legislation passed to support infrastructure, yay, infrastructure, then how do you get members of Congress to support it? Who do you have to build a bridge to? We were talking about the bridge to nowhere earlier. So 
and also to ensure that uh, the Hill was briefed by civilian agencies when it was required and appropriate. As you can imagine, there are always strong personalities working at the White House. Everybody thinks they've got the answer to everything. And in the meeting that I'm talking to, referring to, uh, it was a discussion of some activities that were being carried out that had a detrimental impact on American citizens in that country. And we were mad about it, and we protect American citizens, and we were discussing what should we do. The whole meeting wanted a strong U.S. response, and one that would include military action. So that's why I can't tell you where. Now, my role was confined to understanding what was going to happen and then deciding who needed to brief the Hill before we did it or just after we did it. So in a timely fashion. But I'll be honest, as I listen to this, I'm a diplomat, so I'm not gonna say what I want to say, but you know what I want to say when I say it was outrageous what people were sitting in that room discussing doing in a sovereign nation. BS before crazy is what's in my head at the time. I was ethically bound to speak up, to share my views, but I'm going to be honest with you. As the only woman in the room and the only brown person in the room, I was concerned that I would be dismissed out of hand. And I'll tell you, I probably would have been, in all honesty. I was one of the youngest people in the room as well. I always tell people, run with a posse. When you are trying to get change made, you, it's almost impossible for one voice to do it. You need people to amplify you, to, to turn it over to you, to ensure that you get the floor, that you get the space to speak, to ally with you so that you are not that lone voice. So, as I said, I didn't feel confident enough to say what I really thought. I asked a question that I knew did not have an answer in the room, and so the decision got delayed. Two days. The group was scheduled to regroup in two days. But I used that time, because as I was in the room steaming quietly, I also noticed a couple of other people who were quiet, who were not, yeah, let's do it, let's get them, let's show them, blah, 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 blah. And after the meeting that afternoon, I got hold of one of them, and the next morning I got hold of the other, and I said, did that sound as crazy as I thought it sounded, and they're like, yeah, wow. And I said, okay, then when we get back in there tomorrow, we're gonna have to amplify each other. We're gonna have to amplify each other, think through what we heard and ensure that we do what we can to change the direction. So we agreed to push back, and when everybody agreed, regrouped the next day, the three of us took turns asking questions, poking holes. By the end of the second meeting, the military option was off the table. And other options were on it, and that is what we pursued. And I know, because those two people that I got a hold of, they didn't call me. I called them. So I know we did not do some stupid you-know-what because I was in the room. Once I joined our senior ranks, moving on to another one, about knowing your system. Younger officers reached out to me often as a reference or to give them some career coaching as they pursued their next assignment. Those of you who I got to speak to this morning know I love to talk to people and listen and give counsel. He had worked overseas and as a temporary um, stand-in for someone who was um, on vacation, on holiday, but he wanted to do an assignment in Riyadh. And I had worked there, he knew that, he knew I knew people in the Middle East Bureau, and he asked me to do a recommendation for him. He wanted me to write to the ambassador, and he told me all the people he had reached out to advocating for himself. Oh, you know I love that, you know, yeah, okay, you did that. And then I asked, well, who did you write to? Who have you spoken to? So in case I need to contact some more people, and he gave me the list of names and, you know, the number two at the embassy, the person he's replacing, the person who his boss would be at the embassy, blah, 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 blah. And I said, mm, okay, so I'm gonna share a different lesson with you. You've got to know your system because everybody you've reached out to has no role in the assignment process. 
that was a waste of his effort, and he was about to have me waste my effort, because the ambassador isn't the decider. For our assignments overseas, Washington, because Washington sees who everybody is asking for, where the gaps are, and Washington moves the people around, not people at the embassy. So I redirected him to the right people he needed to write to, and I contacted the Deputy Assistant Secretary, who was the decider in the Bureau, and he got that job. And he learned to do his homework before pursuing the next one. But I'll tell you, I learned that job, that lesson, the hard way. I had been asked while I was working in the Gaza Strip, um, Secretary Christopher made a zillion trips, and I was the control officer. I arranged the motor pool, and I was a note taker in all the meetings with Chairman Arafat. And he came with the spokesperson of the Department of State, who I got to know, who got to know me, which is often how assignments are made. And he asked me to be his deputy. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'll be a great deputy spokesperson. Yes, I'll do that. And I put it on my bid list, which is what we do. And waited to be called for the job. And you did not hear Destiny mention that I had been deputy spokesperson of the Department of State, did you? Because I didn't know the system. And the things I needed to do, I hadn't done. And somebody else got the job. So I don't forget that. Learn your system. One of the ways the Department of State has failed women and minority is indeed in that assignments process. As I said, I thought I'd have the job just because the guy said he wanted me as his deputy. Too often, that is how it works. For much of the department's history, assignments were made through connections. Where you grew up, where you went to school, your ethnic background, let alone gender, could make or break your career. The saying, <laughs> the saying was pale, male, and coming from Yale. That was uh, the same, or another Ivy League school. Up until 2023, one of our most important senior positions, Deputy Assistant Secretary, was indeed decided on those personal traits, who knew you, who liked you. Our handbook actually said in black and white, that these positions would not be advertised or competed. This in an organization that prides itself on everything being done by merit. How could that possibly be when the vast majority of people never were in position to even compete for the positions? So unless someone told you it was coming open, if you weren't in the in crowd, you never had a chance. And it wasn't only women and minorities. Every white guy was not in the in crowd. As you can imagine, the vast majority of those at that level belong to one ethnic group and one gender. When I discovered this as chief diversity officer, I set out immediately to get it changed. I knew the system, I knew who the decision makers were, and I didn't anticipate having to advocate much because it was so clearly unfair. Well, I walked out of that meeting with my head hung low. <laughs> I had presented the need for change, and they left me in a mixture of rage and despair. I told you, people will let you down because it was, it was so unfair and so obviously. But no change, complete letdown. Got back to my office, had to face my team and regroup because we have to remember most people hate change. Hate it. They worry it'll make things worse. They don't understand it. And even when they know that it'll make things better for most people, they worry it won't make it better for them. They don't want to be bothered learning a new system. I had to push past all of this. And so too will you at some points in your career. We got there a couple of months later, but widespread buy-in took longer. We had to communicate, communicate what this was, why this was, and why it was good for everyone. And so my line about every white guy not being in the in crowd, that one I used a lot, a lot. Because 
people could see who were in those positions, and it was vast majority European American males. Whatever the system is, even what, especially if it's unfair or unethical, it is benefiting someone, and you got to get past them. Ironically, the first person to benefit from the new system was a European American male, and I used to take him with me and say, see, this is not trying to put a new group at the top. We're just leveling the playing field for everyone. He was not the last person to benefit from it, but he made my point. Finally, I'm going to share a story that goes to the grace. At a time, I made decisions that probably cost me a job. We can talk about that later if you want. I was leading our mission in Saudi Arabia at the time, and the security situation was very bad. There had been threats against our mission, and there had been terrorist attacks against foreigners that had resulted in people being killed. My staff was on edge, they were frightened. We had to increase restrictions about what people could do, where they could go. People didn't like it, especially my young staffers who were used to a lot of freedom and they could not go where they wanted to go. A lot of people don't know that most missions have far more local staff than American staff. In Saudi, we had about 35 Americans and 150 local staff. That ratio is very, very typical. So as we got different threats in, something came in from another Middle Eastern mission that one of the local staff had been compromised and thought might have been involved in supporting a terrorist organization. We didn't get any more information than that. And remember, Americans move around every two to four years. Our local employees stay for five, 10, 15, 30 years at time. They are the continuity of knowledge, how things have worked over time. They're the backbone of missions wherever you go overseas. If you get in trouble, you may, you'll meet an, an American consular officer, but the person who's done the paperwork, if you've got to get a new passport, if you've lost it, it'll be a locally engaged person. It'll be a locally engaged person in case you get drunk and get thrown in jail and someone's got to come visit you. It'll be the locally engaged person that's done those initial contacts to make sure you are well taken care of. So as things grew tense, our security chief wanted to have our local employees come through an extra level of screening. It would have delayed them coming into the mission, and it would have set them apart from the Americans, their colleagues. I thought that would send a terrible signal of an us versus them, a signal that we didn't trust them because they weren't American. I feared it would crush morale, and I said, no, we're not going to do that. My security chief was angry with me. Several of my American staff questioned my decision. But my thinking was this, either we all do it or none of us do it, because we are all in this together. If anything happens to that consulate, we're all inside, nobody's running around asking, are you Muslim, are you Christian, are you Jewish, are you, nobody's asking. They're shooting, or whatever it is that they're there to do. And I pointed out that when I worked at the White House with a top secret code word security clearance, yes, I had one, blue badge, I had to go through screening every morning, open my bag every morning. It got searched. It didn't matter that I was an American, didn't matter that I had a security clearance. And as I pointed out to my staff, when you go through an airport, does anybody ask your, no, everybody gets screened. I felt there was no reason to divide us, to divide us. My decision held. And unfortunately, as you may have read, in December 2004, our mission was attacked. We lost five colleagues, and all of them were local staff. And I was so grateful that I had held, because I, I didn't even want to go there, but just we were all in this together, and in the worst possible way, that was proved. I did my best, but it wasn't enough to keep the consulate safe. There are times when it just isn't enough. You make a wrong decision, you can't make the case to get more resources, or you prioritize the wrong thing. It happens, these things happen, it will happen, 
It will happen to you. No one is perfect and we all have to forgive others and ourselves and keep going. Gotta keep going. So why am I hopeful? I am hopeful. <laughs> you. Study after study show that every demographic group, European American men included, want to work for an organization that is diverse. Nobody wants to sit in a room with only their group. They recognize all those things I mentioned before about decision making and innovation and cultural competence, that that comes with diversity. They recognize if there's only one group in leadership that probably all the best people are not in the room. And who wants to be excluded? People, you, me, we want to work for organizations that do the work of leveling the playing field, of valuing everyone's contribution, of ensuring that we all have equal opportunity even if it's not equal outcome. Everybody doesn't want to be a U.S. ambassador. Everybody doesn't want to be a deputy assistant secretary. Everybody doesn't want that. So it's not going to be equal outcome and we shouldn't worry about that because people don't want that. But they do want to work for organizations that do the work and reward those of us who do the work because too often it falls on the shoulders of women and minorities. So one of the changes I made at the Department of State was to ensure that everybody was responsible for doing the work and judged ready for promotion if they could show how they had done the work. So it doesn't matter what you call it, the work is going to go on. We all demand it. And that's why. Thank you very much. Okay, everybody wake up now. Questions? Does anybody have a question? Raise your hand. Hi, hello. Um, so I noticed that, uh, sorry, uh, earlier on Who in your you? career, you Who are were. You, sorry? Oh, I'm Vic Vajay. Okay, and are you a student, professor? Oh, oh, I'm a student. God, no. okay. I wish I was a professor, okay, but. Okay. <laughs> but no. Um, so the thing is, uh, I noticed that early on you, in your career, you were an ambassador to Malta. And you know, I was always interested in you know, those ambassador positions in, you know, more, uh, in smaller European nations. So can you just you know, talk a bit about your experience as uh, you know, someone who was in Malta at that point in time? Sure. For those of you who don't know, Malta is a small island state between Sicily, Italy, and Libya, North Africa. 20-minute um, flight to either place. One is more popular than the other these days, but there we are. It's an EU country, and we have ambassadors in every EU country because EU decisions have to be unanimous, and we have to convince everybody when we want them to do something. So that's why we have ambassadors everywhere. Um, when I first got there, there was an issue with Maltese reflagging Iranian ships, breaking sanctions. So that was an issue that I dealt with early on in my tenure as ambassador. Um, the Maltese were very, very helpful when we were fighting Ebola. We all ambassadors got a message from Washington, go out and get donations for the United Nations from your host government. So calling on the prime minister and saying, you gotta give me a check and them giving that check. Trade, uh, TTIP, which died a unfortunate death, but we were pushing it at the time and we needed all EU states to support it. And then I had things that I cared about. We'd like foreign students, I'm sure there's everyone here, to study in the United States. So we did a lot of outreach to the University of Malta. Um, we established the International Institute for Justice and Rule of Law. Before I came to Malta, I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Counterterrorism. And we started a new forum at the United Nations, the Global Counterterrorism Forum, probably, GCCF. And we needed a home. We'd originally thought that it would be in Tunisia, but then Tunisia melted down and had other uh, things to be thinking about, as you all know, with the Arab Spring. And the Maltese stepped up. And in fact, it was the 10th anniversary this last year. I went back and, and spoke at their big, big uh, hosted by the president of Malta to 
um, celebrate 10 years of international cooperation. So those are the sorts of things that I worked on in addition to many others. So you talked about the importance of knowing your system. When you're new to an organization, how do you learn the system? Mm. We talk about three things that are important as you navigate your careers. Wherever you land, as an intern, as worker, as a leader, an advisor, a sponsor, and a mentor. Are people familiar with the three? Okay, so your advisor in the office who tells you where, where to get coffee and where the pencils are and how the computer works, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of that is the overt stuff, but the quiet stuff is how does this work? It also comes from coffees in the organization that I worked for in the Department of State and certainly in diplomacy, those face-to-face -face interactions are really important. You take people out or meet them for a zillion cups of coffee and I didn't even drink coffee for many years, now I do. Now I drink coffee. But conversations, how, how does this work? How did you get this job? That's a really popular conversation because we're all moving around looking for new positions. But just asking questions about the organization, that water cooler that don't, they don't exist anymore, so I don't know, the kitchen? <laughs> or you're making your coffee or your tea? But having lots of engagement with your colleagues as well as reading your employee handbook. Cannot stress that enough because a lot of things will happen to you for you, but when it happens to you and generally it's not good, you better check your employee handbook because it might not be right. They might not have followed the rules as whatever happened. And I just had someone get in contact with me because they got a letter of admonishment for a really stupid reason. I was really surprised that it happened. But doing the digging, we found out that shouldn't have happened and she doesn't have to accept it and she's not going to accept it. But only because she read the employee handbook and found out they didn't follow the rules. So know your system that way as well. Um, so you were talking about in your field, like a lot of people are looking for different positions and always switching. Um, is there kind of an end goal in that or a dream job for you or one in general that people try to attain? Like what's the point of always looking for new positions and yeah. switching? Yeah, that's good. And, and I didn't do as great a planning as I had thought. I came into the diplomatic corps because I wanted to be a U.S. ambassador. That's the top position. That's what the world knows. I wanted to lead a diplomatic mission. I wanted to be the president's representative somewhere. Didn't care where. I, and it's funny because I was on a panel uh, for college students and there were four women. Um, <laughs> and, and the other three were so just modest and, and Oh, you know, I came because the work's really fascinating and good, which is true. And I enjoyed every place, and I never dreamed I'd be an ambassador, and I just wanted to be able to do the work. And I said, well, I, said, I, I came to be an ambassador. That's what I came for. Now, these people here, and of course, all of them became ambassador, so I don't know if I believe them or not, because it isn't something you stumble into. It's because you do good work. It's because you show that you are a good representative and that you can manage people and support people, care for them and help them do a great job. So the changing that goes on before you get to be ambassador is also because we tend to be regional specialists. I'm Middle East, I had Arabic and studied Indonesian before I went off to Jakarta. Um, or subject matter experts, counterterrorism, cyber are the two that were floating my boat. So I delved into those. When I went to Cyber Command, I was thinking about a career after diplomacy and cyber was very, very big in 2016 and I thought I'd done some of it and it's part of my counterterrorism portfolio, let me delve in and get some bona fides. I really hated working at Cyber Command, which isn't to say that it's not a wonderful place to work, it just wasn't for me. I'm an extrovert and they are not. So, um, you are just, I hope, and I tell people when they come in, you can plot your career, but really, if you try and find things that you're going to enjoy, that are going to make 
you smile when you go in in the morning, your step is light, you're glad to be there. People are gonna wanna work with you. You're, many of you, too young to have come across unhappy, bitter, disappointed people, but they are in the workforce because they didn't follow my advice, which is please yourself. And they're unhappy with where they are and they're in the office and it's just a rainstorm when you see them every morning and you really don't wanna be working with them, you know, and you keep your distance because you don't want the rainstorm to get you wet. So try and find things that bring you joy or excite you or you're curious about and pursue those because if you do that and you do well, people will keep pulling you into other interesting things. I always tell people if someone says, come work for me, I try and go work for them because that means they're invested in my success. They don't want to be wrong about selecting me, so they're going to help me succeed. And if I tell somebody, I want to work for you, you should hire me because I'm going to make sure you do not regret that choice. So you're, you're pleasing yourself, which is why I hang out in the Middle East, because I love it. I love the culture, I love the food, I love it all. I enjoyed it. You see my smile even as I talk about it. That is what kept people saying, we want her. Yeah. When talking to students about careers, um, I often suggest the federal service in some way, including uh, State Department. And there are many students who, who question what it would be like to work for an administration that they don't generally agree with. And you've worked through many administrations, <laughs> so I wondered if you could talk about um, yeah. your experience and um, the importance of federal service. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing better than public service. It always feels good to help other people, number one. Depending on what agency you are interested in, there's some things that continue on regardless of who's at the top. I mean, there are things that either via legislation or just federal rules you are, if you're in the Small Business Association, you're gonna be helping small businesses. That's, that's the role, unless they shut down the agency entirely, which we hope won't happen. Certainly in diplomacy, foreign affairs, there are going to be times where you hate the entire administration or times where you don't agree with what is being done in certain parts of the world. Having done the Middle East for over 30 years, you can, absolutely accurately imagine I've been unhappy from time to time. We have a couple of ways, three ways you can deal with that. Number one, which I don't suggest, you can quit and you can do it loudly. When I left government in 2017, I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times. I got a lot of people reading it to say why I thought the administration was failing America via how they were conducting our foreign policy. You can leave quietly if you have another job or you don't need another job. If you're staying in the organization, you can use what is called our dissent channel. It is a method where you can dissent to whatever it is that we're doing in our foreign policy, but you also have the responsibility of sharing what you think we should be doing. So this isn't just you suck, you know, stop it. You gotta say you suck, stop it, and this is what you should be doing, and this is how you should do it, and these are the resources that I think should be put here. So this is a responsibility on you to give options to be followed, and that message goes from you to the Secretary of State. The final thing is, my goodness, the world's a big place, and when I was not necessarily happy with what's happening in the Middle East, then I went off to Indonesia because I can go to Asia, or Latin America, or Africa, or Europe. You can go serve someplace else where we're not making you crazy with the policy, especially if you generally love the work, and you know, this too shall pass, as far as the president's concerned. You only have to put up with maybe eight years. So those are things you can do to keep going. And the overall, it's worth it. Public service is worth it. So the title of the talk, Ethical Imperative and Global Leadership, and our former president used to talk about Ohio Wesleyan being a place where we develop moral leaders for an 
global society, if I get that right. I'm thinking about this idea of ethics and morality and where we are currently seeing failures in our global leadership, both domestically and internationally. I'll keep the commentary to myself. Where do you draw your ethical and moral center from? My personal one? As Yours I and, and, you know, where, where would you maybe direct folks? So we'll make that general. I mean, I'm curious for yourself, but also like, where is you working in civil service? Like, where do you and your colleagues find that moral center, ethical center? Yeah, that is a very personal line. We each draw it in different places and the different things that help us sketch out where it is. Um, when I left in 2017, I could have stayed. My own ethics and self-esteem would not allow me to stay because I knew what I brought to the organization, my skills, my abilities, my perspective and knowledge were not valued. Nobody was interested to know what I thought or what I could bring. They would have had to pay me if I decided to stay but the worst insult my mother could ever give someone professionally is, hmm, they're drawing their breath in their pay, doing nothing else. There are some people who, um, Josh Paul, who resigned a few months ago over Gaza, over the Israeli bombardment and our support for it. And he did it loudly. That's what I said, you can do it loudly and make your, your point known. I believe that if you're going to resign, that you should do a lot of talking with other people for a few reasons. One, that strength in numbers. One person resigning kind of a day, maybe a day and a half, and then it goes away. But a group of people resigning is much more impactful. So I think people should not resign until they have a group and can really scare people that valuable talent. And I assure you, to train US diplomats costs a lot of money. Moving us country to country is a quarter of a million dollars every move, housing family, education, car, shipping, it is a lot of money. The department doesn't want to lose people. But do you, can you afford to quit? Many people cannot. They're either too early in their careers or they've got family obligations or the kids are in school and you need to finish out that school in London because it's a really good school and you don't want to snatch your kids out in the middle of the school year. So there are many things that keep people there and find another place to live, to serve, until they can come back to the department. But it really, it, it's very personal, what you can put up with, what you think is right, and what your options are. And nobody should judge you on that. I, I don't, I had a, a friend, she used to make me crazy because she was complaining about President Trump Oh, daily, multiple emails daily about how terrible he was and how terrible he was for America's reputation abroad and oh, just on and on. And finally, I, I, and I had already left and I said, why are you still there? If you feel this strongly, you need to go. But she didn't want to go. But I said, if you're staying, then you got to stop complaining and do the job. Do your best where you are to preserve the reputation to it. make sure that our allies and interlocutors understand that the president, no president, is fully representative of the American people. It's impossible. So don't judge. I tried not to judge her, but told her to stop complaining. All right, we have time for one last question. I'm gonna give it over to Elliot. Hi, my name is Elliot Spicer, and as a graduating senior, I'm trying to build a system of people and trying to find like careers I'd like to go into. And so maybe I like find some emails of people who work there or something, but I often notice that it's hard to get them to care um, about uh, helping me, like uh, get, get into a system and uh, maybe respond to the emails more. So uh, what qualities can I have even over email that kind of incentivizes a, someone to want to join my system and want to help me uh, in getting a, into my dream career? Offer to pay for the coffee. I have paid for so much coffee for people. <laughs> Offer to pay for the coffee. Um, 
Well, I don't know what kind of people you're reaching out to, because there are lots of people like me, and so I'm, I'm putting myself out there. I mean, if you find me on LinkedIn, I'm going to have a Zoom conversation with you at least. Um, if we're in the same city, we'll have coffee. Usually I buy it, I'll be honest, but we'll have coffee. Because we need you, if, if, particularly if you're interested in talking to someone like me, that means you're thoughtful and you're going to be part of the solutions that we need. And I, I hope not to put too much pressure on all of you, but you know, the world is in a very tough state and we are depending on you to fix it. If you haven't heard, I'm telling you now. And it can be fixed, but we have to have higher standards. It goes back to the ethics. You know, we've got crappy leaders because we allow crappy leaders. We allow. And even, you know, I have views I won't share them with you on the one hand, but as I tell my own children, regardless of who you vote for for president, all those down ballot issues affect your day-to-day -day life. What the minimum wage is, how the court system works. So many things are local issues. It is imperative that you vote because you are putting in the pipeline of leaders who make it up to the president. And if we don't put in compassionate, courageous leaders who don't feel like they have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars for votes, I think you should all support my view, which is that we should follow the United Kingdom. Does anyone know how long election season is in the United Kingdom? Six weeks. Imagine we wouldn't have to hear all this stuff except for six weeks. We could all survive six weeks, right? I would love to get a law to change it to six weeks. Oh, boy. But people thinking that they have to pay lots and lots and lots and lots of money for votes, that means they've got to earn lots and lots and lots of money. And you all probably know this, but once you're elected to Congress, 60%, not 40%, 60% of your time whether you're Republican or Democrat, is going to a little house near the Capitol, and it is a bank of telephones. And your job as a member of Congress is to spend X amount of hours every week at one of those little chairs in front of one of those phones calling, asking for money. And I'm not kidding you. And that's our system, and we allow it. But you can find me on LinkedIn. And my sister Donna will be in touch. As I said, if we're both in Cleveland, we can do it in person. Otherwise, we can Zoom. Mr. Spicer, I'm expecting to hear from you. Mm -hmm. Okay, see where you're at. All right, well, let's thank Ambassador Abercrombie once again. Thank you. The ambassador will stick around briefly if you have a question for her that did not get answered yet. Uh, if you are a student and still need to sign in, please do so um, at the front desk. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.